débat. Let's get started now again, but the topic will be entirely different from what we have been discussing up to now. We'll, uh, we are now focusing on what Mr. Melitu has said. And let's uh, also link this up with my own report, which I will put in here. And uh, uh, I, uh, his uh, topic was really the road uh, transport sector in Europe, how it functions and how it is built up. That was my topic, not so much the social impacts, but I tried to uh, tell you uh, why the liberalization uh, led to a reticence, perhaps also to the trade union side and, and the employer side and their organization, because liberalization had negative social consequences on the uh, labor force here in uh, the so-called rich countries vis-a-vis -vis the poor countries. And Mr. Militio and, uh, focused uh, on a topic which is well known here in the Western uh, countries here, social dumping. Social dumping, I think uh, this is perhaps uh, a wrong, a negative expression because dumping is a sort of that you sell something incurring a loss, but this is not the case here. And uh, the uh, workers in the rich countries I now have to compete, although they had better conditions in the past. Now with uh, the workforce of uh, the poorer countries here, and so this leads to labor uh, strife and difficulties. And so the consequences of uh, liberalization, uh, the reduction of uh, costs and uh, uh, <coughs> and the relocation and so on, which is translated into the uh, uh, decline of uh, the labor conditions here of the workforce. But you have uh, the same also in the maritime transport, in aviation and so on, not only road transport. And so we should perhaps focus our dialogue. Uh, uh, I give the floor now to... Uh, Mrs. Uh, Mario Kopis, because she didn't uh, get the floor up to now. Thank you very much. I think the two topics which we discussed before the break can't be separated. We heard uh, something about India, and in the light of my experience during the past years, I gave some thought of what happened here in my country might happen in India one day. The growth in the logistics field, to my mind, is not unlimited. Uh, I mean, it is mainly occurring in the developing countries in Germany and Europe. There were many developments where logistics services, which were uh, present here, were outsourced, relocated. For example, our army had their own logistics. The automobile industry had their logistics. Trade had their logistics. All these jobs are gone. They have been outsourced. New companies have been uh, founded uh, with lower uh, conditions of employment. But there's not only pressure on the labor force uh, within a country, there's a competition within Europe and the rest of the world. And one concrete example to be quoted here, which also relates to India and its uh, site or location. There are four major global players worldwide where the express market are shared between them. The DHL UPS uh, situated in the uh, United States Fairtex and TNT in the Netherlands. And these companies are represented in more com companies than the ILO. DHL is uh, uh, present in more than 270 countries, and we have a hub in 
Leipzig here, and uh, which has been existing for a short time, and you can go and have a look at it. Three weeks ago, we were confronted with the fact that the customs services, customs clearance, which is part and part, were to be relocated to India. And this makes a lot of pressure on the conditions of work in Germany. Don't misunderstand me. I don't think that anybody should feel hunger here and suffer from famine and shouldn't get good medical care and uh, they should participate in the wealth of this world. But what is gross to one side uh, is uh, a problem to the other side. And so the initial, the starting situation in India cannot perhaps be compared with that of a highly industrialized country like Germany. But in Germany, during the past year, more and more people are now in the low-cost sector and the low-wage sector, which are now pushed below the poverty line. They can't live on their earnings anymore, and they have to get some social benefits now. This is a consequence of globalization as well. And don't misunderstand me. As a trade union, we are not running around and say you should nationalize everything. But certain things need to be regulated. Competition won't solve the problems. There will be a regulation, but not in favor of the employees, the workforce, men and women. So we need a set of rules and uh, regulations for our economic activity. ILO, as an international trade union, we want to see to it that globally acting combines, industrial combines, they are the winners. They don't go to India because they have a social mind and create jobs there. They want to make profit and they get their services cheaper in India. And these companies is must be forced by us that at least human rights and the ILO standards should be recognized wherever they are active in this world. But this is a problem. Let's make this very clear. There are major companies, corporations in many branches which are widely fighting against introducing the minimum standards because the United Nations has given these minimum standards. They should be respected, but they are looking to locations where can, they can exert more pressure on the conditions of work. We can only solve this because markets are not fully liberalized, where the political circles monitor what has to be regulated and how has, has it to be regulated. Thank you very much. <coughs> Who would like to ask for the floor? The uh, DHL case is a good example because I can give you the counterpart of the Indian story, which uh, we are now handling under a project that we are doing for the Express Industry Council. Now, we find just the opposite of your story in the case of India. Uh, in the case of India, what happened is that when the four integrators went into India, they asked for, they said that we are express and we wanted to do certain things. We wanted to do custom clearances and we want to do fast track things. So we should not be clubbed together as freight forwarders. So they had um, come up with their different forms whereby they can get a easy clearances done for their um, uh, freight forwarding. Then they said that we do not want the same EDI system for the logistic provision also. We want a easy, easier EDI and they got an easier EDI and in that process what has happened is that you know the whole set of freight forwarding business which was like fragmented people who are custom clearance agent and freight forwarders had died up because you, the moment you need to transfer something and you have these logistic providers, they are able to get the clearances done much faster than your um, normal logistic companies, you would go in for the express companies. So express companies started almost like behaving like logistic companies. And there is the distinction between express clearance route and logistic route kind of diminished. So having said that, the problem with 
the major integrators are that wherever they go in like bigger players wherever they go in they would like to get you know the ways out and therefore one of the key issues even for a country like india today is as mr thapar has mentioned that government cannot have a total hands off approach yes the free market is operating and where it is operating the government is there but the government's role as a facilitator and as a regulator is very important like you need to see what is happening and then take a decision and then put your acts in place so that you know uh, probably in the case of express delivery there is a need to see what kind of goods should be cleared by express and what is logistics and whether the forms and etc are the right forms otherwise if it is not right i always will have an intention to shift between the services so the regulation becomes equally important even in the case of a country like india and uh, but unfortunately we are still evolving the regulations and that is the most difficult phase and in the case of many of our transport sector because they were either regulated by very old acts which do not take into account the multimodal and the changing nature of the transport so any regulation is taken by the industry as a fresh impingement into their so called liberalized territory so it is not really a welcoming measure but regulation no doubt is necessary i think uh, mr chairman uh, yeah mr chairman sir thank you i i i would like to respond a little bit to to andrea's comments uh, directly in the sense that i i hear those comments a lot from people with whom i debate uh, in washington uh concerns about what we're what we're describing here as as the social costs um often it's it, it, the, that point is veiled however in allegations that our foreign trade partners are cheating uh, they're doing something wrong or they're destroying the environment or they're abusing labor uh mexican trucks aren't allowed on us roads uh, even though part of nafta <laughs> required that they be uh, by 2000 uh so it's not just the logistics or the trucking sector it's the manufacturing sector that 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 makes these arguments but the fact is is that investment really doesn't according to most of the most credible research uh doesn't chase low wages and low standards it doesn't go to countries where uh where labor is treated poorly and where 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 the environment is 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 destroyed it goes places that there there are other factors way in uh proximity to market uh the likelihood that your assets aren't going to be expropriated um proximity to other transportation hubs the skill levels of the of the workers uh in the united states manufacturing um spokes people have been telling us forever that the chinese are eating our lunch and now we're outsourcing to india and the indians are eating our lunch but the fact is uh the us manufacturing sector is stronger than it's ever been we where there is a uh there there's a recession right now but us manufacturing has moved up the value chain and we are ceding to these emerging economies some of the lower value added uh endeavors think of how an economy is valued i mean if you have 10 workers producing a $1000 worth of output that's $100 of output per person $100 salary assuming a simple model but if you have labor productivity if you can trade with others to to make uh to 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 make labor more efficient and it only requires 5 to produce that same amount of output that same 1000 of output their wages double to 200 and now there are five more people in the economy to add value in some other endeavor uh so an example that i like to use is the 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 example of the ipod some of you may have heard this it's kind of proliferating around washington and trade policy circles if you look at the back of of your ipod it says designed by apple in california assembled in china and this to me is a metaphor for the relationship between the rich countries the and the emerging countries uh there's something called uh, the smiley curve uh james fallows who writes for the atlantic described our relationship with with developing countries this way all the high end work on the ipod ipod the high value added stuff is done in the united states the the, the engineering the design the high tech component manufacturing some of the lower tech component manufacturing happens in china the assembling is in china and then comes back with logistics retail servicing the higher paying jobs our our, our workforces uh, are complementary and i think that that uh example 
uh, applies uh, to uh, throughout. Um, so when you hear that the Euro European manufacturing is in decline, well, maybe there aren't so many European products that you see on the store shelves because those products are being made uh, by, uh, by lower value, uh, by, by emerging countries. And the, the European manufacturers and the U.S. manufacturers are making the high-end stuff, the pharmaceuticals, uh, the, the high-tech components, the sophisticated machinery, the technical textiles. These are the kinds of things that create value in the economy. And that's why we're rich countries. I think, Andrea, you raised really philosophical questions. If you think uh, capital can be mobile and the real sector can be mobile, what you are saying is labor should not be mobile. Well, that, I think, in the emerging world will not be a thing which will be supported in the long term. Uh, you also mentioned about the disparities in wages and the working conditions. If you see the cycles in your own countries, which the years gone by, you would find that the developing countries probably would reach, hopefully, the same cycles which you have passed through. These differentials in the wages are a normal phenomena. They reflect the milieu of the country. They reflect the state of economic development. and. If you are able to provide to a person a living wage under humane conditions, you have no business to impose your own social ethos on the developing countries. Now, this is the larger issue. The, at the local level, since you mentioned about Germany, Germany is a part of the European Union. It supported the European Union. You have admitted about eight countries, and you were supposed to integrate them into your economy during the, in 2005 or so. And the recent example is that of the restriction placed by the German government on the migration of workers from the East, eight East Europeans on the, on the plea that it would cause serious labor market disturbances. This development is even against the logic of Europe's own open borders. And this is within the European Union. And uh, when you talk of between Europe and the developing countries, as I said, the, the larger issue comes over there. And let me mention to you another thing. As he, Daniel, was saying, the developed countries have been dumping the sunset industries to the developing countries, be it pharmaceutical, be, uh, be it the petrochemical, be it the mining, any hazardous. What are the developing countries doing? You build ships, we break them. We employ labor in breaking the ships. We are not manufacturing the ships. So because they are polluting industries, and these are sunset industries, these are being dumped across, but there is a labor. There is a labor. And in any case, Throughout history, if you see, it is these arbitrages between wage, knowledge, regulation, which has promoted the, uh, the globalization process. If there is a knowledge, knowledge wage differential or the financial differential, only capital goes over there. If there is a wage differential, people will go over there. If there is a knowledge differential, people will go over there. If that's the essence of globalization. Now, I can understand, to be very frank with you, the pain that it, it brings about, a, a, a change at that particular time. But if you look at the larger canvas, uh, I would like you to smile first. Don't get serious. <laughs> if you see at the larger perspective, uh, Andrea, you will find uh, that these are all uh, transitory phases which will go away. But it will be difficult for the history to inexorable march that will be going to take place. Let me take you back to the centuries. In 1700, China and India accounted for 46% of the GDP of the world. In 1900, we accounted for only 
14 to 18 percent. We are now recovering from that. You can say the cycle is getting recovered. 230 years the countries had to suffer because of the differentials which are there. And you can imagine what was the pain. The countries which accounted for 46 percent of the GDP should be going down to that level. There are historical reasons. There are social cultural reasons and the, the distortions of the past, if they are going to be. And finally, to be very frank, in 2020, it is said that these developing countries, are China, India, will account for a large share of the GDP of the world, much more than the European Union, USA and, Jap uh, USA and the uh, G8 countries. If that is going to be the situation, you have to find out where are you going to place these two countries in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the entire spectrum of the nations. And uh, well, I leave it at that. We can carry the debate forward, anything. Merci. Je vous... Thank you. We, this is very uh, good here that uh, we have this ample opportunity. Mr. Melitu, uh, I think you have the floor now, and then Mr. Mukherjee. Well, I would like to present the ILO's position, which is, is very general, but I think is the fundamental issue. Uh, social dumping. Uh, is uh, this term is used in two ways. Either whether when manufacturers move uh, their activities to another location where they have uh, cheaper labor, or labor is moved, uh, usually temporary or in uh, in a transition uh, to another country by an employer uh, from one country which uh, labor cost is cheaper to another country which is more expensive. So we have these two uh, uh, cases of social dumping and I think uh, both are uh, for importance uh, for us. But regarding the first kind of social dumping where activities whether these are manufacturing or other activities, are moved from one country to another country where uh, labor costs are, uh, are lower. I would like to emphasize that the position of the ILO is that uh, we should see why they are lower. Do the minimum international labor standards encourage this? The ILO would like to see every single member of the ILO, all the 182 countries, to ratify the fundamental conventions, which include abolition of child labor, of forced labor, the minimum labor standards. And then this is an equal and fair basis. And it will not only be the cost of living and the labor uh, cost, but also the other uh, issues like labor protection, etc. And I think uh, it will be a better world if we had this movement of activities only on the basis of uh, cost and not on the basis of inferior uh, obligations from the employer towards the labor force, like uh, health, safety and health uh, issues and other social protection issues. So this is ILO's position that we would like to see every country to apply the minimum international labor standards, and then it will be a fair competition and uh, let uh, uh, the players decide where they will take their business or from where they will move labor from one country to another country. Thank you very much. Yes, I would like to move, and it's very hard to speak after you who have been so authoritative and also compliment what Marios has said. Um, perhaps we can 
unbundle what we mean when we talk of social dumping. We have several benefits and costs at risk here. We have the social direct impact of moving a job from Germany to India. And then we should say, is the cost in Germany bigger than the benefit in India or the reverse? That would be a way of looking at it. Or should we say um, the social, in the, also we have the social indirect impact of communities serving the transport community inside uh, Germany and inside India. We are taking those two examples now. Or we could say the economic impact of keeping cost of transport higher in Germany, what does it do to the jobs outside of the transport uh, industry in Germany? And perhaps the cost inside the transport industry in Germany compares to the benefit of having a cheaper transport. Because we know cheaper transport, as Arpita has, uh, um, uh, generates growth. So perhaps the transport will have a cost, but the non-transport in Germany will have some benefit. And we should compare uh, these two. It should be said that even inside the European Union, the significance of this question, which is so socially um, uh, and politically uh, uh, strong, is different if you are a big central economy to Europe, such as France, England, Germany, or if you are a small and peripheral country, such as Cyprus or Finland, perhaps your benefit is not the same. And you may have within the countries in Europe a benefit very big to Finland and Cyprus who need cheaper transport to keep into the market while uh, it has a different effect on uh, France and Germany. So we cannot today look at the benefits um, simply in one country and simply in one sector. And then I would say, what is the alternative? creating barriers again, which is what we have seen in uh, Maurice Bernardet's paper, the big uh, um, uh, trend today and what is being spoken about in, faces the, 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 in the face of the sector. This brings retaliation, escalation, and major negative effects. Is, can we do that? Or the other impact, which is let us keep the poorer country poor and the richer country rich, and not mind. Well, it is very dangerous to have a poor neighbor. And as long as there will be one Somalia or one Central African Republic in the world, we shall all be at risk. And actually, we were reminded this Monday with some uh, experiment by some northern country, which I shall not name, um, with... Uh, <laughs> so, this is a small world, and there is solidarity that we need to exercise despite the tremendous uh, suffering and political tension. And perhaps we can look today at the world and of the transport community and what is happening in this movement by having one example and one theory. The example is Mauritius. Mauritius was poor. Mauritius was doing what was the, the, the was doing sugar the sugar cane industry, the most laborious, the hardest in the population. Then it moved up. It did uh, T-shirts, and then it grew richer, and then T-shirts were too expensive. Its people were too expensive. T-shirts went away, and it did, um, it did electronics, and it became too rich for electronic, and now they out outsource electronic, and they do logistics and strategy, and they have moved up. They have become uh, richer. They have not made anybody in the world poorer. They have moved the opportunity in this planet in an optimized way as they grew richer and they became a smarter competitor. So perhaps we could look at this process, and that doesn't help us perhaps for today, but for the medium term, as an entropy. We have a lot of contrasts. We have people tens of thousands of people sleeping on the pavement of Mumbai, in Mumbai, 
in a city that is so sophisticated, people do not have, and pay, do not have more than to pay than two square meters. And then we have the richest of the rich. That difference today generates tension and danger. I would take, um, I, I would disagree slightly with uh, Dr. Tapar on the issue that rich countries should not impose their, their ideal. Because this planet is one, we have some things that we need for survival, for sustainability, for safety. And those criteria are those Marios was discussing, saying that the ILO gives standards and all of us should play with that standards. No cheating. And we all are cheating. The Indians are cheating and the Germans are cheating, let's say, and the French are the bad, she's not French. <laughs> um, so we have criteria that we have to abide, and then we have to move towards what the entropy is giving us. That is, as the Mauritius grow fast, grow richer, the Mauritius of this world grow richer and move the opportunity and the type of uh, activities from one country to another, what we want is to avoid extreme poverty, anybody sleeping on the pavement of Mumbai, and nobody has to become poorer in the process. The current crisis makes it an absolute reduction of, of wealth in Germany and in other countries, and that is politically acceptable. But we have no reason to believe that in the medium term, this process of poor country getting better opportunities will not allow all of us to become richer, although at a different rate. Yes, I'm, I'm happy that my uh, contribution led to such a lively discussion, but that's why we are here. To see that we need to discuss these issues because they're very topical and very often they are put in the back burner and they're not noticed because there's so much euphoria in the framework of globalization and all the other issues are also very serious. What Mario said earlier on, that's what I meant. That's why we need minimum standards, that we need minimum regulation and it shouldn't be too difficult for anyone on this planet to say, I accept, first of all, human rights, human dignity. But if that is not possible anymore, then I believe that we have a big issue here. Now, how can we do business and how can uh, most people participate in this? Now, that's the question at the end of the day. And it's not that we sh some good, very rich and shouldn't worry about the rich man losing his wealth. Now, what can we do? How can we distribute what we all generate, the wealth we all generate, so that everyone can participate? And I think this has also been mentioned here. Thank you. Please allow me to give you the definition of performance at organizational level, because this is what we are talking about. Where will you perform better? in this country or another country or using this labor or that labor. So performance comprises three inseparable issues. Efficiency, effectiveness. Can anybody tell me the third one? Participants satisfaction. If you read any book in any library that describes performance, you must, to say, to claim that you perform well, you must satisfy all these three issues. Efficiency, effectiveness, and participant satisfaction. So we have to, uh, we, we must make sure we don't overlook the third component of performance, whether those that participate, they're satisfied. Now, are they satisfied because they get the minimum to live? Satisfaction stems from different uh, angles. It's survival, and then we know all the hierarchy. Uh, yes. So it's also dignity, it's uh, protection, uh, a very good balance between work and life, private life, etc. But if I may, we should add sustainability. 
Because if we do things to the pleasure of some, and this is not sustainable and we destroy the planet or the potential for the future, we have not achieved anything. Well, I think uh, we can congratulate us that we have opened up new routes in our discussion here, not the traditional ones. And uh, I, uh, the main ethics or moral aspects of our discussion is very important, uh, of course. It's a wide scope, but let's go to the practical level here. Well, the Western countries and uh, in Europe and also uh, in the United States, people tend to lose their jobs. They are victims now of an abusive competition here um, between the developed and the uh, less developed countries here. It is a relocation of industrial uh, production and of services uh, in the field of transport, so I'm meaning here. Well, German uh, transport companies, Belgium, uh, British, and so on, complain that the uh, road haulage system is now uh, invaded uh, by outsiders from uh, Poland, from Romania, what have you. And uh, the uh, trade union and the employers' uh, associations uh, do exaggerate. There are very few statistics available on the markets where the markets are seized from outside, that's to say, uh, by haulage companies from Eastern Europe. And uh, some people say it's 50% of the market. And uh, in France, uh, uh, it is being said that in southern France, 50 percent of the truck drivers or the trucks come from Spain. And um, uh, of course, you feel poorer uh, and you tend to feel the loss here because you have the Polish truck drivers. Uh, well, the Polish enterprises uh, say that it's the Latvians or it is uh, uh, some other countries from the East uh, that invade the Polish market. And uh, so it is the rule of the game that you seize the work of somebody else. And uh, as to this uh, transition phenomenon here, this transition will step by step lead uh, to an equalization of uh, the living conditions and the standard of living. And uh, this question uh, is such that uh, how long will this uh, take? Uh, I mean, we have been working on this and we found out that for Romania, for example, the speed, how the uh, wage costs have gone up and up uh, was really uh, breathtaking here. Of course, there are differentials here, but within a few countries, uh, there was a rapprochement, an equalization of the wage levels here. And there were some uh, perturbing factors, disturbing factors here. But nevertheless, uh, uh, it did uh, go up and up. And uh, when you said that the world has to agree on standards here in the field of transport, uh, this is different here in this sector than in wages uh, and conditions of uh, life, uh, of, of work in some other sectors here. Uh, well, in the road transport sector in Europe, there are rules and regulations, safety, security, the uh, infrastructural uh, conditions. But this is a problem which is different. Uh, uh, if there is a, a disrespect, uh, a disregard uh, of the standards, but well, you have to see into this and enforce measures in, in case of a breaking of the rules here. But uh, one has really to apply these rules in the transport companies. Well, let's put some order into our discussion. 
perhaps um, we can now turn to the audience here and uh, perhaps they can make some re remarks or ask some questions addressed to the panel. Anybody asking for the floor from the audience? Thank you. Sarah Fink from the International Transport Workers Federation. Um, the title of um, our conference is Challenges and Opportunities in the Downturn. And I think what is occurring to me as I'm listening to the discussion is what are we talking about? Um, all these issues we're talking about, what has really changed now with the downturn and what are the dangers we're facing? And the biggest danger, it would seem, is that the differential we are talking about in terms of economic differential is actually a rights differential. We are risking that the differences in workers' rights that we see between different countries are actually going to become bigger with the economic downturn. And I'm not sure we're addressing those issues. That, and there seems to be a level of, of schizophrenia in the discussion in that we're sitting here talking about, uh, there's a general consensus in this room that, that there does need to be regulation and there does need to be the insertion of the ILO basic fundamental rights. But in the rest of this building, people are talking about the market as if that wasn't an issue at all. Certainly in the aviation workshop I attended this morning, this discussion would be quite out of place. So my question is really, we're talking about regulation, and regulation would include issues like training for the future. How do we keep, how do we keep the workforce um, that we have at the moment in a place where we can face downturn and we can recover afterwards? Um, and we're talking about uh, we're talking about rights. So, uh, at the same time as we all agree that we don't want people sleeping on the streets in India, we also don't want people sleeping on the streets in any of our countries, whether it be in the U.S. or in Europe. And I would like to know what we really think the role of the state is, and what we think the role of regulation, and what the panel think about that question. Um, so, thank you. That's, that's my contribution. Well, I don't think there's a contradiction here because there is no market without rules and uh, regulation, but there's a framework given for the market to uh, function. There is no difference between the downturn and the normal time because this process of moving activities into Mauritius and out to a poorer place has been with us for some time. And it has been acceptable as long as growth in the richest countries was sufficient for absolute wealth to continue to grow for all. Today we have a different situation where a pop the population age 45 in Europe is poorer for the first time than the parents at the same age. This is the first time. So that process today is inacceptable politically when it was acceptable otherwise. To answer your questions, uh, and then the second point to be made is that the transport sector is more with the tourism sector, but first the transport sector is one of the most impacted by the downturn. Uh, th than others. It is extremely, it generates the shock, but it also amplifies it, and it's um, one of the biggest uh, um, victim of the shock. There are three things that, in its wisdom, the bank recommends to do. I mean, it's not the bank, but it is really uh, wisdom pulled from, from many partners. And the first thing is, first you have to have policies that are spatially blind. That is, you have to have good education, health, water. Arpita has shown how this is important in India, but it is also absolutely necessary in Europe that we do not have worse school in places where the, the, um, there is a depression, economic depression. So, spatially, spatially blind, good social policies. Secondly, smart infrastructure investment even in the downturn, because a downturn comes uh, before an upturn, and we need to be ready. And I think Andrea has spoken of the need to be ready for when things pick up, and it could be very soon. 
It, it may not, but it may pick up slowly, but it may come as well. So infrastructure especially, and that would be also perhaps the conclusion for India. It's not just to have good roads and maintain them. It's not just to have good ports. It's to have a vision of where you will stand in the international market. What is your niche? What is your place? What is your economic and social purpose and goal? Define where you want to be in five or 10 years and then align the logistics and the investment multi-sectorally, multimodally, not just improve your roads. No, roads is, is no use if you don't have a package, a logistic package. So smart infrastructure thought of spatially. And the third one then is corrective intervention. Corrective intervention where people suffer where you lose job, where you have a sector, an area, uh, have fiscal incentives, have subsidies, have special social intervention, safety nets in order to help people and groups of people and areas in when the transition comes too fast. And today with the globalization, these transitions, these movement in and out of Mauritius occur faster than they did in the future. So the people who are caught in the change suffer more because it's more sudden than it was before. I think that uh, we should hijack the discussion into what is happening now. I remember the ILO in 2001 prepared for a major meeting on road transport, and within three months, the meeting changed uh, to address the crisis, the security crisis of 2011 and, and the impact on civil aviation. And although this program was prepared, uh, uh, not having in mind the economic crisis, I saw that correctly the International Transport Forum introduced the subject of the downturn uh, in a very intelligent way in this subject. And I would en encourage Mr. Chairman to discuss these issues. This is uh, what we are all concerned. And um, uh, as you may remember in one of my slides, one of the major concerns of the ILO constituents, which are the social partners, is uh, that this uh, economic downturn uh, may uh, compromise the future, and maybe will uh, not. We will the industry, the, the transport industry, will not be ready to address the needs after recovery. And I will give you some reasons why this may happen, but also some good practices that the ILO has identified uh, uh, during a recent uh, assessment of the impact of the crisis in the transport sector. Uh, on the impact on employment. So uh, one of the major risks is that the first victims, uh, more often than not, that the people that they lose their job, are uh, the usual disadvantaged groups. Young people, it's much easier for an employer not to renew a contract of a new entrant, because a new entrant goes into the job with one year contract to be tested, rather than uh, terminating an existing agreement, which is rubber stamped by a trade union. Okay? So these are the first victims. The young generation, with all that hope, they get their first job, and in nine months, they, are, they lose their job. They give them one or two months notice. Young people should be either on employment, on training, or on education. If they are not on one of these three positions, our society will face a very bad future. We'll have increased crime. You know, young people will be so much disappointed they will turn into other things. But also, if young people are not retained in their jobs, we will not have the skilled labor force in the future. We will have a very big gap. 
So let me tell you some good practices that they have been identified. Uh, I'll give you the example of uh, a government in the East and a government in the West. Let's start with uh, Singapore. There, the government, in order to encourage the employers to retain their uh, staff in the job, not to dismiss them, uh, encouraged them, uh, offered incentives for training. They say, OK, there is not enough work for everybody in the port. Instead of dismissing 50% of the persons, you keep them, and we send them for training. So this is a double benefit, no job losses, but also enhancement of skills. And the government finances 90% of the training cost and also contributes 10 Singapore dollars per hour of training towards the employment cost. So it's a kind of an intervention uh, by the government, but also the employers, they, uh, they take up some cost, but they invest in the future, let's say. In the Netherlands, the Netherlands, the Ministry of Labor, only recently introduced the so-called part-time unemployment declaration of workers. This scheme has already been implemented by a German-owned terminal in Rotterdam, where there was a workforce of 300 port workers. And there was work because of the crisis, because of the reduction of the traffic, for only 150 people. Instead of dismissing 150 people and keeping the other 150, they implemented this scheme where everybody is 50% unemployed. They work part-time. And the other 50% is covered by the government where they pay an, a 50% unemployment. So there is another intervention. And uh, we hope that this will only be needed for a few years. It's not permanent cost. So I have given you uh, uh, the picture of who are the most vulnerable in this crisis. Also, I would like to mention migrant workers. They are the first to be dismissed. And uh, in, in, in some cases, we, we, we've seen some uh, uh, gender inequalities. We've seen women losing their jobs uh, more easily than men. So we have young people, migrant workers, and, uh, and women being the first victims. And I have given you some examples how the job losses will be reduced with some uh, uh, measures. Thank you very much. See, when we, we started, we talking about globalization. From globalization, we went into what should be the right regulation. And uh, maybe from right regulation, at times, we are moving into what should be the protectionism. So there is, in a time when there is a downturn, it is very important to distinguish between what is the right regulation and what is protectionism. And uh, basically, what we see in the developed world today is sometimes you know it is more protectionism rather than right regulation because if you look into the proponents of liberalization and if you look into the wto negotiations be in the doha round or the round before it was not the companies from developing countries who was saying open up the transport sector they were joining hands with companies from European Union and the bigger players. And all these companies who were pushing for liberalization were also from the developed countries. So developing countries were just piggy riding on what the developed countries say. But today we can say there is a job loss because uh, you know workers are moving into the developing country and stuff like that. But how do you explain a job loss? Because one fine day, DHL was told to pack off bags from the US. 
so it is operating between two developed country also so protectionism within the developed country can hamper players from the developed country also operating in those market because it has led to a huge job losses of dhl employees wherever they may be earning in euros or they may be earning in dollars does not matter so what one needs to really focus on in global slowdown is that there is a need for regulation there is a need for training but regulation should not lead to uh, job losses on the other hand one also needs to look into the very practical side of things like if you look into the construction sector in mature markets there is limited scope for increasing the construction because say for a case like road already enough construction activities has been done but when you move into emerging markets there are scope for construction so that gives you an opportunity to actually do investment and once you earn your money there you can also you are remitting a part of the profit it is not that no companies go abroad to invest and make a loss in the market that's not a right business decision so as long as the company is able to survive by diversifying its market it is going to grow in its home country but if it is not able to survive elsewhere it is very rarely is the case that it will be able to grow in its home country so in that way when there is globalization there are some benefits of globalizations which has been uh, reaped by companies now when there is a problem like this that we are going through a downturn it is each country needs needs to look into it as a part of their own development program last month when i was in the eu and i was talking to the german auto industry and uh, they were bargaining for stimulus packages the moment the head of the team came out of the room he told me you sit in a german car and you sit in a korean car and can you make a difference from inside if you have not been able to make a difference that means the german guys have not innovated over the years and if they have not innovated and they have decided that you know i would always get a premium price for a branding then what kind of stimulus package can be given so these are very core issues that were told to us and that is a very good learning experience that we have learned from this part of the world that you know you have to keep on innovating you have to keep on competing it is not like you know india is today labor uh, you know we get labor at a lower cost but our labor cost is rising as an outsourcing hub we compete on a regular basis with china philippines and we have to find out innovative strategies to keep ourselves alive because otherwise it is basically like we are competing with you we are also competing among ourselves and the biggest issue here is what kind of strategies do the government design so that there is enough amount of training their amount uh, enough amount of upgradation of skills upgradation of technology that we keep ourselves alive through a competition thank you um kaksis also die frage des protektionismus the question of the protectionism only comes up if people are not going along when they feel they they are the losers of globalization so how, how can we take them along they shouldn't have the feeling and i speak about uh, europe in the main that during the past years only it led to the deterioration of my personal situation it isn't just a protectionism of companies it's the citizens here what about europe uh, here well on the 7th of june we have the elections for the european parliament this is a hot issue in germany here and we have taken it up as politician and say we want europe and we want to have a global balance here but in a different way i mean our imagination really is and uh, in europe is it has been mentioned that to have a fair uh, work times here in the transport sector that in europe we should uh, agree that for health protection and for avoidance of dangers and hazards for others on the roads that they should only be allowed to work 48 hours and the unification came about uh, but uh, one could not really expand it to sub contractors how they are called so nicely who are 
supposed to be self-employed without any employees. So major companies sort of sacked their employees and called them subcontractors now. And they are the ones who tend to lose their jobs. And they don't occur in the unemployment statistics because they were self-employed, supposedly. And we have to regulate this. We did have this kind of regulation. There was competition before we had the economic downturn. But if we can't succeed in uh, settling this, then we haven't taken the people along. It's not an abstract discussion. Very few people from politics and the industry uh, talk to each other. We need the acceptance of the wider audience for whom we cater. This is important. Uh, I just I wanted to sort of piggyback on Arpita's comments. I, I agreed with uh, with her perspective, and to get back to the, the original questioner, I think maybe Arpita and I belong in that other uh, the other room <laughs> where where the market uh, uh, orientation seems to be more prominent. Um, gov governments shouldn't be doing government should be doing as little as possible. All right, in, in the, today's world, we are. Rich countries and emerging countries, we are competing not just for markets on behalf of our companies, we're competing for investment, we're competing for opportunity, we're competing for human capital. And countries need to cre come up with creative ways to create their own competitive advantages, their own comparative advantages. An example that, uh, that I think of in the textile industry was you know, a few years ago, Cambodia was wondering how, how are we going to compete with China when the textile quotas are, are expire. And one thing that they did was they, want, they developed a niche as um, a, a place to do business where labor standards, ILO standards, are exceeded. Because brands and companies, you know, people like to talk about sweatshop labor and, and the tendency of capitalists to want to abuse that. I think it's more the exception than the rule. But this is, and for, for, for capitalist reasons, for self-motivation, self-profit reasons, businesses don't want their names marred by things like that. So, so Cambodia carved out a niche. Uh, Europe can carve out niches. Uh, Europe has advantages. The United States has advantages. I, I, for example, you know, we have more higher learning centers than any other country in the world. Lots of research is done there. It's a great reason to attract scientists and engineers and people to facilitate the upper end of the production process. Um, Europe can do the same thing. Um, so the role of government, I think, is to make that apparent, make that as easy as possible, not to pick winners and losers to a transaction. Uh, you know, when, if you, there, there's nothing in my view that's fairer than an exchange between two willing participants. Uh, if, 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 I, and, and if I want to transact with somebody, I should be able to do that. When the government intervenes and says, well, you know, maybe you shouldn't just transact with him because what about him? That, that is suddenly unfair. Uh, the, the playing field should be level. There should be so, some social safety nets. Uh, people should have portable insurance and should have access to compensation when they're unemployed. But I, I even question whether or not the government has a huge role to play in, um, in giving skills, retraining people, because it's not the government that knows what those skills are. It's manufacturing. It's the services sector that have a, has a better idea. And in my conversations with manufacturing uh, lobbies in Washington, they say their, their number one concern, at least prior to the, the economic contraction, was the dearth, the absence of high-skilled workers uh, in the United States. So we need to change our immigration policies. We need to be more welcoming of people. Uh, and, and we need to have policies that, are, that, that, that eliminate the frictions I mean, here there are frictions, perhaps, you know, if you, it's hard to hire and fire people. There are more regulations in Europe than there are in the United States. So uh, keeping government out because it leads to all sorts of unforeseen uh, circumstances is a good, a good idea. The, the one foreseen circumstance, I think, when you have a lot of government involvement is that government becomes more powerful. All right? the, it's the regulator who people go to lobby. Instead of in, indulging and engaging in productive behavior, productive activity, you devote your resources to winning his favor. And that is, that, that is unfair and it's unproductive. So my, my capitalist view. Well, let's turn to the audience. Anybody else asking for the floor? Well. <clears throat> Le 
Grimm, Senior Economist, Federal Ministry of Transport in Germany. Um, I have uh, two specific uh, points related to the discussion uh, we uh, present uh, have. The first one is I'm completely missing passenger transport. We're all talking about well, uh, transporting goods, but there's also trans uh, passenger transport. And one of the major social impacts might be that people lose the uh, possibility to participate in mobility and thus uh, participate in uh, society and uh, uh, today's uh, life. So uh, this uh, might be a very negative social impact of uh, the economic downturn we are having at present. And uh, second, um, I heard a lot about uh, growth rates and markets and uh, um, how to address uh, markets, but what about addressing needs of uh, people, of mankind, the so-called satisfaction uh, factor? Um, if you climb up a ladder, a ladder there you will soon reach a point where you're just on the top, and then what do you do? Do you stand? Do you, do you remain standing uh, on top of the ladder, or do you decide to uh, step down and uh, go to another uh, place? Um, when uh, I heard the discussion uh, today, I'm just missing this point. Um, where is all the uh, social impact discussion about structural change, change management? I heard only uh, one point from the Indian Institute for Transport Development which addressed uh, 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 changes uh, in uh, structure, restructuring uh, sectors, restructuring uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, the exchange between uh, countries and uh, trade patterns. What about uh, that point? And um, uh, third, um, I would be very much interested in uh, hearing about benefits uh, rising from uh, now nowadays uh, downturn. We have a lot of uh, problems we are facing. It's uh, demographic change, it's uh, climate uh, issues. Um, we have plenty of negative uh, impacts of uh, uh, transport we have to deal with. So couldn't be the present situation, a situation where all countries stand together and really address these problems by uh, looking for new interdisciplinary solutions, how to cope with this. This is a singular chance and a lifetime to do a real restructuring of uh, global markets and global transport uh, systems uh, um, worldwide. Thank you. You. I'm Simon Bennett from the International Chamber of Shipping, the International Trade Association for Ship Owners. Um, without wishing to sound too complacent, um, it's just possible, bringing it, bringing it back to transport, that you might just learn some um, lessons from the shipping industry. We were, a for, uh, of course, the very first um, globalised industry. But in shipping, I think it's fair to say that we actually enjoy um, very high labour standards, notwithstanding the fact that about two-thirds of our seafarers are recruited directly from developing countries. And this is because through the International Labour Organisation, um, we have a system of international labour law that is enforced internationally. Um, and we have a new um, convention we're very excited about. We've negotiated with our trade union colleagues in the International Transport Workers Federation, the ILO Maritime Labour Convention, um, which we expect to come into force probably within the next 18 months, two years. Um, but I, I appreciate our industry is a rather peculiar industry, but I just wanted to point out that in our sector, um, we actually um, re rejoice in our um, globalised um, status and the um, I think very good em employment standards, job opportunities that we um, provide to our seafarers worldwide. Thank you. Une petite intervention, puis ensuite on... Well, perhaps the panel can be 
called up here. What does strike me here is that one of the speakers said, well, there is a conflict between the liberalized markets and regimentation or regulation on the other hand. I mean, this uh, contradiction might be there, but uh, perhaps one has to take a clear look here. The uh, market economy can function based on certain rules and regulations here, public regulations. It's the states or the international organizations as well, and perhaps also the local policy makers, the uh, public policy makers are justified to intervene in some aspects uh, well, uh, without uh, putting at stake uh, the liberalization of markets. It's a social standards, a minimum of them, security and safety measures as a minimum standard, and rules concerning uh, minimum rules of competition. Uh, because if you don't have a framework, uh, then c competition tends uh, uh, to turn oligopolist into monopolies. And, um, well, uh, one does have to have this kind of a setting here of regulations. And this uh, temptation of protectionism is a reaction. Uh, by those who uh, think uh, that the standards to be respected are not sufficient. And uh, perhaps uh, you can be called upon to react on or respond to what I've been saying here. <clears throat> Let me say something about the port workers. We are very uh, proud that we have this international convention here, but it doesn't only based on the recognitions of the employers. We did have some conflicts here, and in the international trade union movement, we really did fight for the respect of these standards. Well, we were successful in this field. Let's try it in some other fields as well, perhaps, because, of course, we have to talk to the employer side as well, because it's not necessary to uh, take the means of last resort in order to fight them. I think we can do a lot of convincing work. Another example is that in Germany, during the past century or millennia, let's just say 10 years ago, the Employers Association, together with the trade unions, uh, came together and negotiated the wages uh, for the transport sector. There, the Employers Association was very few members, and those who are members, uh, they don't respect the uh, collective bargaining agreements and the wages laid down. And these are the problems where, uh, we, with which we are confronted. We don't know the answer. In our social partnership, as practiced in the past, we don't have any counterpart any longer. And this is this unlimited market economy in the past and a lack of regulations here and there. I'm not for nationalization. I'm convinced that the social market economy uh, uh, can survive, but we have to go back to that uh, status. And this is what uh, people have forgotten, that in the past it did function. And the, we have to open up uh, venues now to address ourselves to the employers, employers association to reach some agreements that we did have in the past. <clears throat> I will just respond what Daniel was mentioning. Coming from the Cato institution, naturally, is a proponent of the free market. And uh, I, was, I felt a little uncomfortable when you said you are not very comfortable in this room, but you would rather be in the other room. Uh, having said that, political economy, Daniel, is equally important. And that means the state is an important instrument for bringing about a change. When the downturn happened, it is the state which finally bailed out the banks. It finally played its role. It has to play a role
for a, providing a social safety net. And uh, having said that, it doesn't mean that it will meddle at every level, but it has an important role so that the people's interests are protected, at least they are articulated and then come to know about it. I quite agree with you that this downturn should not be an excuse for protectionism or inward-looking policies. Hopefully, as the signs are there taking place, there will be a change, there will be always. And fear is the worst enemy, always hope which brings about the innovation, which also brings about the change. The gracious lady over there, she mentioned about the absence of the passenger transport. And frankly, I compliment her because in the morning session also, it was the, it was the passenger which was missing. It was an airport versus the airlines. But the, that, the, that little Johnny was missing, missing from the discussion and how does he feature. And here, passenger transport is important for several reasons. One is the mobility and the associated benefits of that. But the other is, it contributes about 10% of the GDP comes uh, throughout the world from tourism. And it, it plays in a huge important role in that area. Uh, I am not saying that the people should be footloose as we Indians are. Uh, but <laughs> you should be, you know, uh, contributing towards the uh, to the tourism sector and that she has a point over there uh, what I wish to assure her that uh, people's lust for knowing whatever is in the world and uh, I'm speaking from Germany and this is one of the nations which contributes the maximum to the tourism uh, in the world uh, she mentioned about the satisfaction level. Uh, frankly, my dear lady, I didn't get it. Uh, at what level you get satisfaction? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure, and I would be grateful to you if you elaborate on that point, because it will enlighten me on that uh, issue. Well. I try uh, to explain it a bit. Uh, the satisfaction factor is uh, the factor that decides about how you perceive transport or how you perceive uh, life. Um, there are some people who are happy with less money than others. So there's a satisfaction factor which uh, rises from how you look at the world, how you look at the situation. I uh, I put it this way because well, I'm looking for benefits arising from uh, the situa situation we have uh, nowadays. One of the benefits could be that we look at the transport sector as well, uh, um, passenger as goods, um, from a different perspective than we did it during the last uh, decades. Um, for instance, come back to what transport is. Transport is just a tool. It's not a standalone uh, issue. It uh, is there for a specific purpose. And uh, you can only uh, have a, a, a better structure in uh, the globalized transport system if you look what transport stands for, what society and uh, interaction between countries you want to have, what industry uh, needs, what uh, people needs and uh, which problems you need to, to uh, avoid. Transport is just uh, um, a life vein for uh, every day's uh, life. It's a life vein for uh, industry, but it, all, it all also um, is for a specific purpose in every day's life. It's the participation in society. So what about uh, those people living in rural areas? Uh, the lady from India addressed it. Now we have a better transport system and uh, uh, children have a better education in uh, India. So this is uh, one factor of participation. If you have uh, no money, if you lose your job, you can't use public transport. 
So this means a severe threat for your uh, everyday life. If you have mobility of workers, uh, most of them have families behind, have kids. This also has a social impact on uh, families or how, uh, how you raise uh, your children. Therefore, uh, the satisfactor, uh, satisfaction factor includes much more than just looking on uh, costs and, and, and uh, prices and uh, market uh, share. It includes a lot of uh, uh, um, further uh, issues which definitely um, are very, very relevant for uh, societies. Uh, societies not only in Germany, but worldwide. And uh, if you look at the um, uh, diminishing participation in uh, transport, there are also severe threats due to the uh, instabilization of uh, region we are acting with in globalized uh, transport. If you have no uh, stability in uh, politics, if you have instable situation in society, you have uh, further threats for worldwide transport system. And transport is, as I said at, uh, at the beginning, a life vein for uh, today's life. Merci. Thank you. I don't think uh, this has widened the perspective, um, which already was quite wide. Well, I think uh, we have to sort of concentrate now. I don't want to draw conclusions, but uh, there's a French proverb say that those who are absent are wrong. And I... Uh, find it regretful that the participation level wasn't all that high, but uh, this illustrates a very, uh, uh, this proverb, those who weren't here are wrong. And uh, this was a very rich experience which we had here. And uh, I think, uh, of course, we couldn't resolve any of the problems here. But uh, I think uh, the, we put the issues, uh, problems very uh, correctly here. And uh, we perhaps made some headway here. Thank you to the panelists and also those who asked for the floor from the audience here. They helped us to advance the discussion here. And, uh, well, we have the reception at 18 hours at the airport of Leipzig. Uh, and the bus is waiting for us here at uh, 15.40, uh, 15.50 here. So thank you to all of you. On behalf of all the panelists, thank uh, Morris for his graciously conducting this session and uh, bringing to the discussion an in-depth understanding of the issues and also a very high level of empathy with the major social issues. Thank you very much, Morris. Thank Thanks you. so much.